Hello, you're watching RPTV News and my name is Dmitry Martinovich. On today's episode, RPTV's Executive Director Adonis Huggins will be joining me in a very special presentation of RPTV News. We will be speaking with the Honorable Bill Blair, a Member of Parliament and Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. We invited the minister to speak with us about the recent announcement by the Liberal government that they would be banning some 1,500 assault-style rifles and to find out what the government plans to do to make Toronto's inner-city neighbourhoods safer from gun violence. Welcome to Regent Park TV. My name is Adonis Huggins. And my name is Dimitri Ratinovich. Today, my colleague and I will be speaking with Honorable Minister Bill Blair, who is a Minister of Parliament representing Scarborough Southwest, and is also for Public Safety and Emergency and Preparedness. Welcome to Regent Park. Donis, it's great to be on Regent Park TV, and it's great to see you again. It's been a long time. It has been a long time. I think that people don't realize that you were not only the Chief of Police for Toronto Police Services, but were the Divisional Commander for 51 Division, which at the time was located right here in Regent Park. You know, and, and I think a lot of people weren't aware that when I was 22 years old in 1976, when I first joined the Toronto Police Service, they sent me to Regent Park. And I walked the beat in Regent Park for five years. And, and that's where I learned how to be a police officer. And that's where, where I learned how to be a neighborhood cop. And, and I, I did come back 15 years later to be the unit commander there. And then, of course, I became the chief of police. But the lessons I learned in Regent Park, are the, the, I think, are the things that made me a better police chief for the city of Toronto. A lot of Regent Parkers remember you fondly as someone who was open, wasn't afraid to dialogue with community members, was in defensive about police failings, and even allow community members to be involved in uh, police training. So you still have a fan base here among older residents. I tell everybody I'm from Regent Park because I spent so much of my life there. And, and I, I met so many families, so many great people, community leaders, um, people that were real role models to me and then became wonderful partners to, me, to, to, to the work I was trying to do to keep people safe. And so um, I, I have very, very fond and warm memories of Regent Park and I think it made me a better cop. That's great. Is there um, one or two memories you want to share right now? Yeah, two, two things I'll, I'll, I'll share with you. When I first got down there, like I said, I was a 22-year-old kid, and I didn't know very much about being a police officer. They taught me the law, but I thought I was a law enforcer. And it took me about three months to figure it out. And it was the people at Regent Park that taught me my real job. Because as I walked around that neighborhood and I got to know people and their families and talked to their mothers and their kids and, and some of the community guard, guardian fellows that were working in there, I really got to understand my job there was to serve the people of that neighborhood and to keep them safe. And then I spent five years in that neighborhood and it was five of the best years I ever spent in, in, in policing or in my life. And then the, my second really important memory is when I went back and I was so saddened, to be quite honest with you, with how the relationship between the police and the people of Regent Park had deteriorated. There was a lack of respect on both sides and fear on both sides. And so I knew what my job was and it was to go back out into the community to connect with, with many old friends and many new friends and, and to find ways to reach out into that community and, and, and just do a better job of serving the people there. And, and the things I learned in those two experiences, Adonis, when I became the chief of Toronto, I told my police services board that it was my intention to, to police the city of Toronto the way I had always tried to police the, the community of Regent Park. And that, and that if we could succeed in Regent Park, we could see, succeed in the rest of the city. And, and, and it helped me a great deal. And, and so I take the, the memories of people. And, you know, the, the neighborhood was great, but the neighborhoods changed, but the people don't. And so, I, you know, I, I look back and think about the, that the, all of the years I spent in Regent Park and all of the friends I made, and those are, are friendships I will value all of my days. I can tell you that you set a model for how relationships with senior police should be going forward. I know that for a fact. After you left, you were always, we were always pressuring future commanders to be as open and inviting to the community as you were, and allowing community members to engage with police and doing trainings. So it was great having you in to work in the community for sure. So one of the reasons we invited you here today is to talk about community safety. As you know, Regent Park has experienced more than its share of tragic deaths due to gun violence. 
And if we look at the statistics for 2019, the city of Toronto has experienced the worst gun violence since 2014. So the first question we have for you is, what are you and the Liberal government doing to try to make neighborhoods in Toronto and municipalities safer places to raise families? Adonis, when I, when I left the Toronto Police Service, one of the reasons I decided to go to Ottawa is because I thought the federal government had a responsibility and a role to play in keeping communities safe. And so we've been working very hard, first of all, in making sure that we take the steps necessary to keep guns out of the hands out of our communities and out of the hands of people that would commit violent crimes with them. Um, that work has, has, has begun, but there's so much more to do. And I'm hoping to bring forward legislation um, this summer and before the house rises that that will make it harder for people who would commit crimes to get access to guns. And we also want to empower families, communities to take the steps necessary to keep themselves safe. But for me, it has never been just about law enforcement, Adonis. And it's also, about investing in communities and investing in kids it's, it's helping young people make better choices and and I, I find that if you if you support community leaders and youth workers and teachers and parents and those kids in their community invest in them and, and help them make sure that they have hope and opportunity and start to address some of the social injustices that exist in our communities so the people are treated fairly and they know they're going to have a fair shot at success then those kids are far less likely to get involved in gangs so there's a law enforcement component to this, and, and there's also a gun control component, but I want to make sure we strike that balance and we help young people make better choices. And that's what we've been doing as a government. Like, yes, we are in, 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 in supporting law enforcement to deal with the guns and the gang violence that is taking place, because that's an important part of keeping safe. We are taking really good, I think, appropriate steps to strengthen gun control. Just last week, for example, we've prohibited over 1,500 weapons that were designed solely for the purpose of killing people. There's no place for them in our society. And, and, and I think it takes courage and, and, and will, and commitment, to prohibit those weapons. And we've done that. But we, we have so much more to do. And I just want to assure the people of Regent Park, there is no greater responsibility for any order of government than the safety of our communities and the safety of our kids. And we are going to do what is necessary to keep people safe. But I don't see the answer to that just in law enforcement. That's a component, but, but I think the most important part of the answer is investing in our neighborhoods and communities so that our kids can have better opportunities and make better choices and live better and safer lives. That's ultimately how we keep the community safe. And that's how we serve the people at Regent Park. And how willing are your colleagues from other ministries willing to have those conversations, Bill? First of all, I actually work with the Prime Minister every single day. He's all in. Like it's one of the reasons, like I made a decision, all three parties came and asked me to run. And, and I sat down with all the leaders of all three parties. And I asked them, what's the plan? What are you going to do? And, and, and I explained to them what was important to me. And, and it was Trudeau for me who said he was prepared to do the work, to invest in kids and work, invest in communities to improve the quality of people's lives. And he really was understood and was committed to the diversity of, of, of our city and understood as well that that diversity is, is, is not a challenge to our safety, it's how we stay safe. It's the way in which we embrace each other, support each other and respect each other. And, 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 th and that's why I went with him and, and he's all in and so is our government. It's, it's, if, if, you, if you take a look at the promises we've made, the platform that we've been provided, the mandate that the prime minister has given to each of us, it's all about keeping everyone in our community safe and also making sure that they have every opportunity to succeed and that everyone in our, in our country will be treated with the respect that they're due. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague who has a few questions for you. Prime Minister Trudeau has just announced uh, on May 1st, 2020, that the Liberal government would be banning something like 1,500 uh, makes and models of military-grade uh, assault-style weapons. What uh, makes these different? What, what makes these weapons different to the ordinary shotguns and rifles that um, um, that are available? You know, in, Dimitri, in our country, our laws say that you can have a firearm for hunting and for sport shooting, but that's not what these weapons were designed for. These weapons were designed for soldiers, for soldiers to kill other soldiers in combat. They are weapons that were designed to be used to kill people, intended to be used to kill people, and tragically in this country and around the world, they, that's exactly what they've been used for. 
you know, in Canada. We had 14 women killed at a, at a college in Montreal in 1989. We had even th only three years ago, six Muslims that were at worship in a mosque in Quebec City were killed with one of these weapons. We, we've even last two weeks ago in, in Nova Scotia, we had 22 innocent people lost their lives. And these were the type of weapons that were involved in, that, in those terrible crimes. There is no place in a civil society, they're not used for hunting, they're not used for sports shooting. They're just used for killing people. And unfortunately, in, in our country, the gun lobby has been very influential with certain politicians. You know, they're, they're, they, they throw money around, they, they, they support certain political parties, and it has been difficult and challenging at times. And this is a battle that I have been fighting for three decades. So we need stronger gun control. And now we've, we've taken the first step, but the first of many steps yet to be taken to make our community safer. If this is what we're going to be doing now, how is it that these weapons were uh, available in the marketplace uh, already? Uh, and how many of these uh, 1,500 uh, weapons were available to most people? Yeah, the, you know, there's over 200,000 of these guns in Canada today. And, and there are 1,500 different variants of them, but there's over 200,000 of them. They have, it's a very lucrative market in, in the gun industry. And there have been people that have been purchasing these things. Um, they're, 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 these are devices, again, that were only designed for soldiers to use. And there's no place in a civil society. As I said, they have no sporting purpose. They're not for hunting. They're not for sport shooting. They were designed to kill people. And, and so there's no place. And so we have, and I will tell you, it hasn't been easy. It's, the, the, there's a, a lot of challenges in, in taking the action that we've taken, but it was the right thing to do. And I've been advocating very strongly and the prime minister supported uh, me in doing it. And so now we have prohibited those weapons. But Dimitri, I also want to be clear. It's, it's, it's only the first of many important steps. There are steps that we need to take to, to keep handguns out of our communities. There are steps that we need to make sure that the guns are not being smuggled across the border from the United States or stolen from legal gun owners or illegally diverted where somebody buys them legally and sells them legally, illegally. And so we're going to bring in new, strong new regulations to control that as well. And then, and then just as importantly, I'll, I'll also say, we're going to introduce what we call red flag laws. And, 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 and I think this is a very important concept. You know, if somebody is suicidal or involved in a bad domestic situation where the presence of a firearm represents an unacceptable risk, or if somebody's online and they're, they're spouting and advocating hate and violence against a religious minority or a minority group or any vulnerable population, we have to make those situations safe, which means we have to deprive that individual of any access to a firearm. And so removing a firearm from a situation where suicide's a possibility, removing a firearm from a domestic violence situation, or making sure we disarm people who are advocating hate and violence against vulnerable people are all important things that we can do to keep our society safe. And we'll bring in the legislation and the resources to make sure that our communities and women and doctors and teachers and parents and family have the ability to keep themselves and their families safe. So when we look at the, uh, the backstory in many of these incidents of gun violence, the underlying component is uh, always uh, mental, the mental health of the individual. Um, and you were just speaking about that. Uh, so what is the government going to do to address mental health and what many believe are the root causes uh, for these mass shootings in our society? You know, I, I want to be really clear because sometimes we stigmatize people that suffer mental illness. And like all, all of us are human and all of us can at different point, times in our life suffer from some problems with mental health. Men, men, people who are suffering from mental health issues are not in of themselves dangerous. But unfortunately, in some circumstances, it can become dangerous. And when there is a presence of a firearm in those situations, those dead, dangerous situations can become deadly. And so we'll keep guns out of, out of those situations. But it also requires that we make significant investment in communities to provide support services for people who are suffering mental illness. I'm always, I always try to be very careful, Dimitri, not to stigmatize people. We need people to come forward and say that they are suffering and that they need help so that we can get them the help that they need. And I know from decades of experience, people who are suffering from mental illness generally are not, they're not dangerous and they're not a risk to anyone else, but under some circumstances, it can become dangerous for them or for others. And in those circumstances, we have to act. 
but we also have to invest in, in those people and in our communities. It is an obligation of, of us as a society. And, and it, it, it's good to remember the, the, the people who suffer those illnesses are ill and they, they deserve good health care and, and a commitment to quality health care is part of our Canadian values. Sorry, Bill. Why do you feel the need to have a grandfather clause? The people that bought these guns, they're law-abiding Canadians too. I don't agree with their choice of weapons. I think, I think there's no place for these weapons in our society. But when they bought them, it was legal to do so. And, and so I, I have to bring in legislation and get a budget to have a buyback program because so that we, I want to treat these people fairly. What we have said is you cannot use this weapon. So they're, they're grandfathered. It's an amnesty for a two year period. And during that two year period, we'll bring in a buyback program. But in that two year period, they can't use the weapon. They can't shoot it. They can't take it hunting. They can't, they can't sell it. They can't transfer it. They can't bequeath it to their kids. Um, it, all they can do is store it securely in a safe or a vault. And un but until we can bring in the legislation and the budget that'll be necessary to, to buy them back from them, I didn't want to put them in a position of criminal jeopardy. They, you know, if somebody bought a gun legally and then we said, you can't have it, it's now prohibited. You know, I didn't want to create a situation that people who that otherwise were law abiding were now put in a position where they were breaking the law. So that's what the amnesty is about. And I think it's also very important that the Canadians that own these weapons, they're not bad people their weapons are dangerous and there's no place for them. We're going to take the steps necessary to get rid of their weapons and get them out of our society. We'll do that through a legal buyback program and I'll bring in the legislation as soon as parliament resumes so that we can make that happen. And in the interim, I want to make sure that those weapons don't represent a risk. So you can't use it. You can't transport it. You can't sell it. You can't transfer it. It'll have to stay locked up in a safer vault until we can take the steps necessary to get them out of our society. Uh, Minister Blair, how much uh, pushback do you uh, foresee with respect to the population of uh, legal gun owners who see the passing of this kind of law as an infringement of their personal freedoms? Uh, they are The argument being that most gun owners are already extremely responsible and complying with registration, storage and usage, and that the incidents of gun violence come at the hands of those who have obtained weapons illegally. What do you say to these people? Well, first of all, I think if, you, if you're going to deal effectively with gun violence, you have to have the courage to talk about guns and where they come from and how they end up in the hands of criminals. I'd also point out to them that, you know, when, they, when people start talking about their right to bear arms and, the, and, and c calling it a freedom, I respectfully disagree. That's, what, that's the law in the United States. In the United States, they have a different culture, a different tradition, and a different legal framework for firearms, in that under their constitution, people have a right to bear arms, and they carry those arms for a purpose of protecting themselves from their fellow citizens. That's not the law in Canada. In Canada, the, the, the ownership of and the possession of firearms is a privilege, not a right. And it's a privilege earned by people who obey the law, who follow all the rules and regulations of, that we have put in place for the, the safe, legal, and responsible use of firearms. And, and so one of the things I find, for example, with these uh, military style assault weapons, people who make a living selling those, they realize there's not a lot of public support for that. Overwhelmingly, even hunters and farmers know that there's no place for this in hunting. These, you know, you don't take a 50 caliber uh, rifle out and shoot a rabbit, they would vaporize the darn thing. So like these weapons are, are, are used for killing people. And so th there's not a lot of support among hunters and, and farmers. And so part of the pushback is what we call deception and obfuscation. They try to, they try to suggest that, no, you're going to ban shotguns, which are used for hunting. And that's not true. There's a lot of misinformation that they'll put out. Um, and I don't care about that, to be honest with you. I only care about public safety. And, and so we'll do what is right and necessary. Um, and at the same time, I'm always willing to acknowledge the overwhelming majority of hunters and farmers and sports shooters in this country are law abiding. They're responsible and conscientious. They deserve our respect because they earn our respect, because they adhere to our, our laws and, and all of the rules. And they're careful and, and thoughtful about how they, they purchase, use and store their firearms. And for those who aren't, there needs to be rules and regulations to control their behavior. And if they refuse to be, to, to, to be law abiding, then there are consequences for that. But I will tell you, there are some weapons that can't be regulated, should not have to be regulated. They were designed to kill people. And tragically in this country and around the world, 
that's exactly the way they've been used. In, in America, it's a little bit different. I remember after, and you may recall this, there was, there was a terrible tragic mass shooting at a, at a little elementary school in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, and 22 little children were killed. And I remember going, because I was, I was vice president of the major city chiefs at the time, and I went, went down to Washington with my colleagues from the big cities across North America. We went to the White House and we went to Capitol Hill and we said, now, if, if, if not now, when? When would you ever be able to ban these weapons after they'd been used in, in the most horrific of crimes? And the poor Americans said, well, now is not the time and it's too hard. And, and I felt sorry for them. And in Canada, we have a different legal framework, a different culture, a different tr tradition, and, and frankly, very different values. We value each other more, I believe, and we don't believe it's necessary to arm ourselves to protect ourselves from fellow Canadians. And, and so we have prohibited these weapons. And by the way, most sensible countries in the world have done exactly the same thing. New Zealand, Aus Australia, the United Kingdom, most of European countries, countries that have very similar values to ours, have acknowledged there is no place for these guns in, our, in their society or in ours. And so we've all taken the sensible step of, of prohibiting them from our, from our countries. This is certainly a very divisive um, uh, dialogue that we're having. And um, uh, already in Ontario, uh, our Premier uh, Ford, Doug Ford, has criticized the ban, saying that uh, more should be done in terms of stemming the flow of guns and um, uh, what do you have to say to that? Well, first of all, I've, I've yet to meet a conservative in the last 10 years who was willing to do anything about guns. So I understand the position he articulates. But, you know, last year, um, the federal government, and it was me, I brought $65 million to the province of Ontario and made it available to the premier and to his government to invest in, in policing and law enforcement uh, for guns and gangs, but also to invest in communities. And, you know, the municipalities are waiting for those resources. And I think we're all anxious to see. I was actually kind of encouraged when I heard the, the premier um, articulate his concern about the need to take greater effort at the border and, and to reduce gun violence, because um, I agree with that. And, and we're, we're taking those steps. We brought a lot of resources to the province of Ontario. It hasn't yet been allocated, but, you know, perhaps by the statement that he made last week, um, I, I'm encouraged by that, that perhaps now the funding will flow to the police and to our communities. And so we could start doing the things that need to be done to keep the kids in our town, communities and neighborhoods and in the province of Ontario safe. And by the way, we brought money to all of the provinces and, and, and that work is happening right across the country. Different neighborhoods, different parts of the country have different needs and different concerns. The, the source of their violence sometimes has different origins. But I will tell you as well, Dimitri, because I've, I've been dealing with this. When, when I was the police chief, we actually worked really hard in neighborhoods. And, and I put cops in schools and police officers walking in neighborhoods and working and talking to people. And we managed by 2013 to have cut from 2005 and six our, our gun homicide rate in half. Toronto became the, the safest large city uh, in North America. And, and it was because we were working so hard at reducing violence in all of our communities. That work is important and it needs to continue. And our government's doing what it can to support municipalities and the provinces in doing that. And I'm encouraged that the premier also sees the need for that. And I'm, I'm very optimistic he'll join us in that effort. So how much uh, of this um, recent decision by your government has been driven by uh, uh, this uh, striking incident that just happened? And how much of it is part of a, uh, um, another political or social concern around having uh, guns available to people? Dimitri, for me, the keeping communities safe and the reduction of gun files has been a lifelong work. When all three parties came and asked me to run, um, a lot of what I talked about is how do we keep our communities safe? And, and so one of the jobs the prime minister gave me was to, to come forward with good public policy um, and, and to work towards keeping communities safe. And so this is nothing new. Um, we also have seen in, in Canada a long history of, of gun violence. And in the last five or six years, we've seen the numbers starting to go up. And you, you alluded to this earlier in, in your opening comments. We've seen an increase in gun violence in, in this country. And so during the last election, we were very clear. We ran on a platform that we were going to strengthen gun control and that we were going to make investments in kids and communities 
that were going to make our community safer. And, and we became the government. And so we, we made a promise to Canadians and, with the, with, and we have every intention of keeping it. Um, we, we have been working towards the announcement of the prohibition. It's the first and very important step of what will be several important steps that our government will take to, to keep Canadians safe. Um, you know, I, I, I think I will always be haunted by the realization that if we'd only been able to bring in this prohibition sooner, it might have made a difference in Nova Scotia. That's, that's perhaps unlikely, but we'll never know. But never again. I have to tell you, Dimitri, for me, never again. And that's why we've prohibited these weapons. We'll do everything we can to get them out of our country. And never again, someone intent on mass burner will be able to get their hands, I hope, on a weapon that was designed for the efficient use in the killing of people. Sorry, uh, Bill, do you plan to do anything around handguns at all? Oh yeah, for sure. Adonis, we know in our neighborhoods and, and you know, for a lot of the, the gangs and, and people that commit violence in our cities, handguns are the, ga the weapon of choice because they're concealable and they're deadly. And, and so we know there's three ways in which those guns come into our, our, our communities. They're smuggled across the border, they're stolen from legal gun owners, and, and in some cases, they're purchased legally and then sold illegally by gun traffickers. And, and so those are the three ways the guns come into the, in, into the community. We're going to shut down all three sources of supply. We're going to do that by new, new resources at the border, but also new offenses, new penalties for, for gun smugglers. For those who, who steal them, we're, we're going to bring in new rules that every handgun needs to be stored in a secure gun or a safer a vault. And we'll define how strong that has to be so that they, they can't be easily stolen. And, and for people who buy them legally and then sell them illegally, they need to, need to get caught. So I've got to make sure that the police have the tools they need to catch and deter these people and prosecute them. And then when they do prosecute them, that means new offenses and new penalties. You know, the trafficking of firearms is a lucrative criminal enterprise. And, and there, we need to do everything we can to make it more difficult for those crimes to be committed and then create real consequences. But as I said earlier, it's not just about controlling the supply of guns. It's also about controlling the demand for guns. And there are demands among our young people. You know, if people are afraid, if our kids are afraid, some of them might be tempted to acquire a gun to protect themselves. If, if a gang is, is in, in, a, in, a, in a dispute with another gang over turf for whatever reason, then they may be inclined to go and get their hands on guns to, to advance their own criminal purposes. We've got to work in our communities to keep our kids out of those gangs and to help our kids feel safe and secure in their own communities so that, that fear, fear is the greatest enemy in public safety in my opinion, because when people become fearful, they, do, they make mistakes and they do the wrong thing. And so we've got, to work, do, we've got a lot of work in our communities to give those kids better choices, to give them the support and the help that they need. And for their parents who are struggling, some mother who's trying to raise her kids to be good citizens and she wants to make sure they get a good education, that they can get a good job and that they will be treated with justice and dignity in our society. We've got an obligation to that mother to help her in the raising of those kids so that those kids can turn, grow up to be, you know, great citizens and, and contributing members of our society and are not at risk of getting involved in gun or gang violence. Is there anything else that you uh, feel that needs to be uh, addressed um, that we haven't spoken about? You know, I, I've watched because I'm, I, it's my, you, you, through you guys, I've got a bit of a chance to talk to Regent Park. And I've watched the transformation of Regent Park from, from the mid 70s when as a young kid, I first went down there. Um, and, you know, Regent Park goes back even further for me. My mother went to Lord Dufferin um, in public school. And, and, and actually, she was born in a house um, on Reed Street, which, which is they knocked it down to build North Regent. Um, that, that neighborhood has been part of generations of my family for a very long time. I've worked there and got to know so many great people there. And then I, over time, I've watched the transformation of my neighborhood. And I want to just share with you all what a source of pride it is for me to, to see how that community has evolved and moved forward. And, and I think about all of the people that I knew there and how they made that happen. Uh, the, the one thing I used to try, try to explain to everybody who didn't understand Regent Park that it's a neighborhood, a neighborhood full of families and, and kids and people who just want to live lives of, 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 of safety and prosperity and harmony. And, and, and from my experience, it was a great neighborhood and I'm very proud of what it's become. Great having you on the show. Thank you, Minister Blair. The safety of our communities is an ever-present concern for everyone. Knowing that 
assault style rifles will now be banned in Canada will go a long way in easing the public's concerns around gun violence and gun control. My name is Dmitry Martinovich and you've been watching RPTV News. Join us again when we continue to report on stories and issues of critical importance to our neighborhoods. Like, share and subscribe to our channel. For more information, follow us on all our social media platforms. And don't forget to visit our website as well as comment down below what you thought about this video.